Hi everyone, it's David from Automotive Press. As you know, buying a new car is perhaps one of the most important things you might do in your lifetime because they cost so much money these days and there are so many different ways to make a decision that it is very difficult to do the right thing. In the past, I've done a number of videos trying to explain to you what is the right way to buy a new car. I'm going to add one more very important factor and it is a business tool or business methodology called a life cycle cost analysis. If you can figure this one out, then you will be able to make the right choice in terms of buying a car every single time. So let me explain to you this very important business tool which you can use to make the right decision because so many of you guys tend to make a decision based on buying price. So something like uh, Nissan Kicks behind me, it's very affordable and reasonable at about $37,000 Canadian or about $30,000 US. And this is much more expensive than Lexus GX on my left. But is it really cheaper to buy the Nissan Kicks over the GX if you were to own it for five or six years when you take into account operating costs, insurance, maintenance, and also the resale value? That's a big one right there. So if you do the analysis correctly, you might find that cheaper cars are not always cheaper to own over a certain length of time. So let me explain to you what life cycle cost analysis is so that you can make the right decision every single time. Let's go. Welcome back. So how do you decide which car to buy based on what I call life cycle cost analysis? Now in case you didn't know, this is a tool that all corporations and businesses use to decide what they should buy, whether it's equipment or whether it's machinery, cars or anything else for that matter. Life cycle cost analysis is a foundational tool for making purchasing decisions. But we don't always follow that same methodology when buying a car. And I'm telling you right now that if you can figure this out using life cycle cost analysis, you will make the right choice every single time. Why is that? Because most of you guys decide which cars to buy based on purchase price, which of course is the most important factor, but people don't realize that there are so many other factors. In fact, there are seven things you have to keep in mind when deciding to buy a new car or even a used car. And then if you can take all seven factors into account, then you will get the best values. So let me go through all seven of them. And the first one, of course, is the purchase price, which is what 90% of people spend 90% of time figuring out. But what you don't realize is that there are six other things to keep in mind. The second one is the obvious one, and that's the resale value, or sometimes what we call disposable cost in business terms at the end of its life. So three or four or five years down the road or even longer, when you decide to sell the car, what is the resale value at that point? And the difference between the purchase price and the resale value is your total depreciated value. And that should be the most important factor that you need to take into account. So for example, if you end up buying something like Toyota Land Cruiser, which is way more expensive than let's say something like this one, which is a Nissan Kicks. But the Land Cruiser hardly depreciates and I know that the one I own, I can sell it one year later for almost the same price as what I purchased. So it's possible that the depreciation cost could be almost zero or very small in the case of Land Cruiser. Another example is that we had a 2021 Toyota RAV4 hybrid. We kept it for three years. We just recently sold it for just $1,000 less than the purchase price. So over the course of three years, it only cost $1,000 or about $333 per year. So once again, because the resale value is so high, the overall depreciated value is so low and that really lowers the total cost for you. So purchase price minus the resale value is first of all the most important thing. So don't always assume that just because the purchase price is low, like this one here on the Nissan Kicks, that is the best value because if this particular car depreciates a lot, then the amount of money you lose over a period of time you own the car could be a lot. On the other hand, you might end up buying a more expensive car, which has a really good resale value and the overall uh, depreciation might be very small. So that's the first two things you need to keep in mind, the purchase price for obvious reasons, but resale value, which is a very important one. And there's a number of ways to figure that out. You can kind of search your local area for used car market and try to figure out and estimate uh, how much of a value your car might retain. There's also a number of different resources you can go and get an estimate, such as what we call the black book. They will give you some approximate resale value of the car of your choice, assuming that car has been around for a while, and you can then figure out the depreciated value. But there's more things to keep in mind. In fact, five more. The third one is also pretty obvious, but people forget about it, 
it's your maintenance cost. So that includes your tune-up, your service cost. Some manufacturers obviously include uh, service fees and it's included as part of your uh, warranty period. But most manufacturers don't have that and you have to take your car into either a dealership or to your local mechanic to get it serviced. And for some cars, the service cost is pretty low, like most of the mainstream brands, whether it's Toyota or even Nissan, Mazda, Honda, or American brands, they're all pretty reasonable cost. But when it comes to say German brands, like for example, Porsche or BMW, any of those brands have much more expensive maintenance costs, unless of course the maintenance cost is already included and thrown in as a free package when you purchase the car. So take the purchase price minus the resale value that give you a depreciated amount now you gotta tack on the maintenance cost over the course of time you're going to own the car so whether it's three or five or five years you can quickly do an estimate by phoning your local dealership asking them for average cost of the service fee and add that into what we call the life cycle cost because once again life cycle cost is the total cost of ownership including everything so that's the third one maintenance the fourth one is closely related to maintenance, but a little bit different because it's wear and tear. So even though you might, let's say, get a free service package from a dealership, or maybe the manufacturers have thrown in service cost as part of the deal, well, usually wear and tear are not included. So if your tires wears out, or your brakes wear out, your wipers wear out, these are not part of a service fee or service package, and you will have to pay for them separately. So if you were to buy, uh, let's say, a sports car, which have a very high wear rate for brakes and potentially tires as well, then if you own the car for three or four years, you'll likely have to replace tires, let's say, halfway through, depending on how much you drive. And the sports car tires are very expensive, so that could easily add a couple of thousand dollars to your life cycle cost. So don't forget the wear and tear, primarily tires and maybe brakes, and also some minor consumables like uh, windshield wiper blades and, and some other fluid that you have to put into a car. Those are all of the wear and tear items that you will have to add on. And there could be quite a bit of difference among cars because sports car tires are much more expensive than kind of mainstream tires that you get in a normal, let's say, SUV. So keep that in mind. So that's the fourth factor, which is wear and tear, but there's more. The fifth factor is also somewhat related to the previous two and it's basically your operating cost, which is primarily fuel cost. So your fuel or potentially um, charging cost if you have electric cars, those are all the costs that people also forget. And you know what, sometimes people say, hey, I'm gonna buy a hybrid because they are substantially cheaper to fill up than non-hybrid cars. But that might not necessarily be the case because not all hybrid cars have a really good fuel economy. For example, Toyota's iForce Max engine, in Tacoma or let's say in uh, Lexus GX for example it's a hybrid system but the hybrid system is not designed to maximize fuel economy but instead it's to maximize power and torque and therefore the fuel economy is only marginally better than the cars without the hybrid system so you can't always assume that hybrid model will save you substantial amount of gas you can only figure that out by calculating and comparing the fuel consumption of all the cars you're considering buying and then do an annual cost as estimate based on your mileage and then again extrapolate that over the ownership time so if you own it for three years calculate for three years if you think you're going to own it for five years do it for five years and add that to the total life cycle cost and you might be surprised that the fuel cost might not be the biggest factor in your life cycle cost because you don't drive that much for example if you drive very small amount of mileage per year then even if you happen to have a gas guzzler it might not be a big deal but of course if you drive long distances or if you drive a lot then buying a hybrid with a really good fuel economy or even a plug-in hybrid which doesn't use gas at all might be the best solution uh, keep in mind though that some people who have purchased electric cars do not have uh, charging capability at home so they end up going to a charging stations and these costs have gotten much more expensive than before. Still cheaper than filling up your car with the gas, but sometimes not much cheaper. So again, take that into account, go to your local charging stations and find out how much it costs to fill up an electric car or plug-in hybrid car. And then take that into account as another factor for life cycle cost. The next factor or the sixth factor is insurance cost, which is also something that most people forget to look into. 
For example, you guys probably know that I have a Lexus LC500 and I really like that car, but it turned out the insurance cost for that vehicle is almost twice as much as my Toyota Land Cruiser. Even though I don't drive the LC500 that often, and even though you think the operating cost is reasonably low because it's a Lexus, but for some reason the insurance cost is really high, so much so that I'm considering selling the LC500 because I don't feel like paying double the amount of insurance for that car compared to let's say my Land Cruiser or if I were to buy a Lexus GX as an example. So go and do estimate. Most insurance companies will give an estimate for the cost of the insurance. Uh, obviously the cost of insurance is also dependent highly on your driving record and also where you live and type of driving you do. That's all part of it. But assuming that you have an access to a quote and pricing before you buy a car, go and get a pricing for insurance based on different type of models you're considering and you might be surprised to find out that some cars cost way more for insurance than others and also this is an annual cost so if you keep the car for three four or five years it could double triple and or multiply the cost differences so even though you might say hey it's only seven hundred dollar more for insurance for car a versus car b well if you keep the car for 10 years that's seven thousand dollar more so do not minimize the factor involved in insurance, go and get a proper quote for that. And that could also help you decide which car to buy. Some people like to buy um, you know, used sports car, for example, and they don't realize until they get it that the insurance cost is really high. And it's something that we often forget and sometimes we don't take into account when deciding which car to buy. The seventh and the last one is very minor, but it could also add up and that's subscription cost. That includes everything from the connection fee to satellite radio. And sometimes we again forget that it adds up over a period of time. So it might be 20, 30 bucks a month, but over the course of five or six or seven years, it could add up to a lot of money. And some people also have other subscription fee that they're paying to a dealership for additional coverage, such as covering the wheel damage or to cover the door dings or door dents. There's kind of additional costs you can pay per year. It could also be towing or a membership fee for something like a AAA or CAA here in Canada. And again, those are all the costs that you might have to take into account to figure out the total life cycle cost. In the context of everything else, subscription costs are very minor, but don't forget to add them up because again, over the course of time, they do add up because you're paying something every month. So now that you've got all seven factors, again, the most important is the purchase price, minus the resale value that will give you a depreciated value and on top of that depreciation you're going to add on five other things that i talked about everything from maintenance operating costs insurance wear and tear maybe subscription costs add all them up and then make sure that you're calculating over the course of time that you're owning the car so again three or four or five years or ten years whatever length of time you might keep the car for do it based on that calculation then divide everything by the number of years you plan to own the car and that will give you the total life cycle cost per year and that's the best way to compare a new car or even a used car side by side because once again you might surprise you when you do this to find that the car you think is cheap and affordable when you buy it might end up costing you way more because all the other factors are more expensive on that particular car. On the other hand, you might be able to buy a more expensive car based on the initial sales figure just because it's got a really good resale value and low maintenance cost and overall the life cycle cost might be low and over a course of three to five years, you might decide that you can actually afford to buy that more expensive car because the running cost is low and you might not lose much money when you sell it. So that's how I decide all my cars. So you guys know I buy a lot of cars over time because we have a fleet of seven cars in our corporate fleet and I base it on this exact methodology called a life cycle cost. And based on that, for example, some of the best cars I've had so far are Toyota RAV4 hybrids. They have a really low maintenance cost and a high resale value. But even Porsche Macan GTS that I own several times had a really good resale value and therefore I didn't lose that much money. And right now I have a Land Cruiser which has also great resale value, low maintenance. But on the other hand, I'm surprised to find that my Lexus LC500 has depreciated quite a bit even though it's an inspiration series, it's a limited edition model. 
but you know what there's not a lot of demand for this car right now and therefore it depreciated like a normal sports car and that's a bit of a disappointment and also the insurance cost is very high on the LC500 so I'm thinking of maybe selling it for those reasons once again these decisions are all based on this life cycle cost analysis if you can apply all seven factors you will make a right decision every single time like I have been able to make for most of my purchase decisions and I hope that this means that at the end of the day you're going to save some money and make the right choice. I hope this was very helpful. Let me know in the comments below if you want clarification on how the life cycle costs work. You can also apply this exact same approach to everything else you buy in life whether it's iPhone or MacBook or clothing or bicycle you can apply all that. You'll find that some stuff have a very high life cycle cost, such as technology items like iPhone because they depreciate so much. And other items like watches or bicycle, they don't tend to depreciate that much if you buy the right one. So the ownership experience or the life cycle cost is actually quite low. And therefore, you can apply these things to many things you buy in life. Anyhow, if you haven't done so yet, would you kindly give me some thumbs up? and make some comments and and if you haven't subscribed yet would you kindly subscribe as well i hope this was helpful and until next video i'm signing off for now thank you so much